Are we nearly there yet? Um, I used to say that phrase a lot. I remember as a child, as our Land Rover rumbled through uh, the African rainforest and there'd be these massive green trees like skyscrapers either side of the muddy red road and uh, we'd have a long journey, maybe eight hours to the capital and I'd say again and again, are we nearly there yet? These days the scenery is a bit different on the M4 and I'm in the front of the car, not the back. But still, I hear the same question. Are we nearly there yet? I wonder if we ask that question as Christians. Are we nearly there yet as Christians? Maybe uh, you know that you haven't started down the Christian road at all, and you're just considering things, and you're very welcome here. Or maybe you don't really know, am, am I a Christian? Am, am I not? Don't really know. Or maybe... Um, we know that we are Christians, but actually someone asked me a great question recently. They said, Reuben, I am a Christian, but I don't know if that's really enough. Do I need some kind of extra thing to make me a really special Christian? Sometimes I feel, and I wonder if you feel like this sometimes, too spiritually dry or cold um, or just tired of the same battles with temptation. Um, or we feel sometimes that other Christians seem to be doing so much better and sometimes we just long to get to heaven and we think, are we nearly there yet? Um, think of the first century Christians in this town in Colossae in modern day Turkey as they rip open this letter that the Apostle Paul has sent to them. And they've been doing so well. But as we'll find in the rest of the letter, uh, they're hearing voices perhaps from the world out there or perhaps from uh, some in the church saying, well, if, if you really want to, uh, to arrive, if you want, really want to, um, to be something special, to feel that you've made it, well, Jesus is fine, but you need something extra. You need maybe some extra experience or um, just a better, higher expectations of yourself or uh, you maybe just need some better experts. Are we nearly there yet? The whole message of Colossians is that Jesus is enough. If we have Jesus, you are the real deal. He's enough, more than enough. And in today's Bible reading, God says to those Colossian Christians two things. First, you're reconciled by Christ. Secondly, continue in faith. He says to Christians, you are reconciled by Christ. Continue in faith. Let's see those one by one. First, are we nearly there yet? If we're trusting in Jesus, yes, we are reconciled by Christ. Look down, please, at verse 21. If you have a church Bible, it's page 1183. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. There's a slight hum, is there? Would I be better off with, with the time mic, or be okay with this? Everyone, are we happy? Good, okay, fine. Uh, good. It says here, he's reconciled you. Did you see that? Verse 22, now he's reconciled you. Are we nearly there yet? Yeah, Paul's right to his readers, yes. If we trust in Jesus, we are reconciled by Christ. Remember last week we saw that Jesus is supreme. Supreme over creation. Supreme in reconciliation. Reconciliation for the church and uh, one day he'll reconcile even the cosmos itself. Are we nearly there yet? Well if we're trusting in Jesus then yes we're reconciled to him. See what we were. We were enemies. Reconciled. Look down at us. Uh, 21 again, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Grateful for Stephen uh, for doing my hard work for me and teaching us that reconciliation means enemies becoming friends. And that's what's happened if we're trusting in Jesus. Enemies made friends. And if we're not yet trusting in Jesus, uh, I guess the opposite is true. Uh, we're still enemies of God. Not just that he's our enemy, but that we're his enemies. Um, that we're alienated, it says here, cut off 
from our maker. I guess that's not a popular idea these days. A friend of mine said to me, he said, I I like to think that everyone's basically good. Well, I'd like to think everyone's basically good too. But if this is true, if this is the cage that we're in, we need to see the cage, and that's a good thing to see it, if there's any hope of escaping it. A group of people with some particular struggles were were talking with each other. This is a true story. And um, one smart young man, very smartly dressed, joined the group. And uh, he began blaming other people, saying how he was brilliant, he was perfect. Um, He always did everything right. But how other people uh, were the reason for all his problems. And um, the group listened patiently to him. And after a long time, a man in dreadlocks and dark shades said, I used to think that until I achieved low self-esteem. I used to think that until I achieved low self-esteem. What did he mean? He meant that as long as we think it's all somebody else's fault, uh, there is no hope. Where can I go if it's all someone else's fault? But if I can see that I've failed, that I've messed up, well, that's a good place to start. If I can admit that I've messed up, I've thought wrong, I've done wrong, naturally I should be God's enemy. And I can't fix it by myself. Well, then there's hope, hope of reconciliation. See what we were, reconciled enemies. But what hope? What hope that I, with all the things that I've done wrong and said wrong and thought wrong, what hope that I could be reconciled with with God, with a God who is perfectly just and brilliantly good and terribly powerful. What hope that I could become his friend. And so we need to be reconciled by Christ. Are we nearly there yet? If we're trusting in Jesus, then we are reconciled wonderfully by Christ. Look down at verse 22, please. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight. Reconciled by Christ. That's amazing, isn't it? Isn't that enough? By Christ. I mean, imagine, um, imagine I, I needed to pay a fine. Suppose I've, I've got a, a speeding fine or something, and I owe a fine. Quite right, I ought to pay it. Um, I've done wrong. But then imagine I get a phone call from the Queen... Does the Queen make phone calls? Anyway, imagine I get a phone call from the Queen, and she says, it's okay, Reuben, I'm, I'm going to pay your fine for you. That'd be extraordinary, wouldn't it? I mean, if anybody did that, that would be amazing. But for the Queen to do that? Amazing. How much more amazing, then? That is Jesus, the Supreme One, who pays the price for our reconciliation with God. Jesus, just think who he is. Remember last week we saw he's supreme over creation. He's supreme over black holes and buttercups. And we've seen that through him and for him everything was created. He is the image of God. He has supremacy over everything. And yet he should be the one who died on the cross, who humbled himself and hung in torture and blood and shame, who died for me. Can you put your name there? He died for me. And, and took in himself God's right anger so that we can be reconciled to God. If only we'll receive it. It's stunning. Friends, have you been reconciled by Christ? Have you prayed? It could be a very simple prayer. God, I'm sorry for doing wrong. Thank you that Jesus died for me. Please help me follow Jesus as my king. And if you've done that, then we can say, are we nearly there yet? Yes, we are. We are reconciled by Christ. Reconciled enemies. Reconciled by Christ. Now, and this is the bit that really blows my mind. Reconciled and holy in God's sight. Look down again, please, at verse 22. But now he's reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. 
Are we nearly there? If we're trusting Jesus, then yes, we're reconciled and holy in God's sight. And I think, what? Me? Holy? Pure? Set apart? Without blemish? Free from accusation? You've got to be joking. And if you're anything like me, and the Bible says we all do wrong, how can that be? How can God call us holy with all my failures that I know only too well? And is this just a future thing? Does this just mean that one day, when Jesus comes again, that then we will be holy? We won't do anything wrong anymore. We'll only, only say good things. Um, we'll only think true things after that point. And wonderfully, that's true, isn't it? If we trust in Jesus, that is, that is our great hope and certainty. And yet, twice more in Colossians... It, Sometimes if you're reading the Bible and you're not quite sure what a bit means, it's worth digging around in the rest of that letter. How is that bit used elsewhere? So here this word holy, how is the word holy used elsewhere in Colossians? Um, Well, twice more in Colossians, Paul calls his readers holy already. So chapter 1, verse 2, this is how he addresses them to God's holy people in Colossae. And chapter 3, verse 12. He says, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. How can he call us holy when he knows our failures far better than we know our failures? Well, look again at verse 22, would you? Halfway through verse 22, to present you holy in his sight. That's the key. Holy in his sight as God sees us. God sees us as holy if we're trusting in Jesus. As a holy means set apart. It means pure. Now, does that mean, mean that God is blind or ignorant? Well, surely not. God is God. The Bible is clear. He knows everything. Um, he knows I still mess up. But if I trust in Jesus, then God chooses to see me as holy, as pure, and set apart. Imagine, um, this is a, it's far better than this, but imagine this. Uh, imagine a child is rude uh, to their mum, very rude to their mum. And uh, the child gets um, told off and sent to the naughty step or their bedroom or whatever. And they come back a bit later, they say, mum, I'm sorry. I've been rude, I'm sorry. And mum says, I forgive you. It's okay, I forgive you. But it, it kind of, um, you know, festers. And later on the child comes back and they say, I'm such a rubbish child. This is like several hours later. I'm terrible. I was so rude this morning. I'm rubbish. And imagine their mum says, what are you talking about? It's all forgiven. I don't even remember. Well, she does remember. But she's choosing uh, that as far as she's concerned, it is closed. It is finished. Well, in a tiny way, it's like that. How much more with God? But it's not just that he has selective memory or kind of turns a blind eye. No, Jesus really is perfect. Jesus never did anything wrong, always said everything right. And Christians are united with Jesus. And it's not just make-believe. You know, let's pretend that we're united with Jesus. We have God's Holy Spirit in us, and we do. If we trust in Jesus, then the Spirit joins us to Jesus. We really are joined to him by the Spirit. And so the moment someone becomes a Christian, we are reconciled, holy in God's sight. Praise God. So are we really nearly there yet? If we trust in Jesus, then yes. Praise God, we're reconciled by Christ. Maybe you think, Reuben, it's all very interesting theology. But you don't really know what I'm facing. Where's the cash back? How is this going to help me practically this week? Well, we can be greatly encouraged. Because this means if we're trusting in Jesus as our Savior and Lord, God is pleased with us. Whoever we are, whatever we're going through, if we're trusting in Jesus, God is pleased with us. And we can be sure we're going to heaven. A Christian friend said to me this week, he said, Reuben, I don't know if I'm going to heaven. I said, 
why not? He said, I don't think I'm good enough. Now, I know my friend. I know that he's sorry for his wrongdoing. I know he believes Jesus died on the cross for him. I know he wants to serve God. And so I said to my friend, I said, did Jesus die for good people? No, my friend said, he died for bad people. I said, do you think Jesus is good enough to save you? He said, yeah, I think he probably is. My friend can have absolute confidence he is going to heaven, not because of his up and down performance, but because of Jesus' perfect performance and because he's already reconciled to God in Christ. Friends, do we have that confidence? Then let's pray that our experience of living a holy life will catch up with our status of being holy. Let me say that again. Let's pray that our experience of living a holy life practically will catch up with our status of being holy. I pray that God will work on us by his spirit. It's called sanctification is the technical term. That we will start to talk and think and act and feel more like the way we are in God's sight. Holy. Um, again, any illustration is falls far short. But imagine that, um, uh, that you gave me a present. And the present was a passport to some wonderful country where I'd love to go on holiday, say to Italy, for example. You gave me an Italian passport with my name and my photo on it um, and, and some, the, the keys to a, a villa in Italy. And you said, Ruben, you, you now have Italian uh, nationality. You have a, a villa in Italy. You may go on holiday there whenever you like. And um, that'd be amazing, wouldn't it? And I'd think, wow, think of the mountains and the beaches and the, uh, the, the culture and the food, the pizzas, the weather, amazing. Now, I hardly know a word of Italian. I wouldn't really know Italian culture, how to behave if I lived in Italy. But I think I'd start learning if that happened to me. I'd start, I talk with Pete or someone to get some Italian lessons and I'm trying to learn a bit about Italian culture, which football teams to support, all of that. And, um, and it wouldn't happen overnight, wouldn't it? And I'd probably never lose my English accent. But um, over time, I would pray that my... I wouldn't pray. Sorry. <laughs> over time, my, uh, my experience uh, and my behavior would catch up a little bit with my status. Well, a bit like that. If we've been reconciled in Christ and called holy in God's sight, then let us pray earnestly that God's Spirit will help us to be more holy, more like the Lord Jesus in practice. And that's not going to be a sudden big step from zero to 100%. It's going to be a wiggly line, you know, with some downs as well as some ups. And I won't get to the top till, till I'm, I'm in heaven. Um, I'll always be a forgiven sinner, saved by grace. But by God's grace, let us seek real progress to start winning fights with temptation that we used to lose. Maybe let's talk about it with a Christian friend that we trust and ask them to help us with some specific areas. Are we nearly there yet? If we're trusting in Jesus, then yes, we are. We're reconciled in Christ. Now, secondly, finally, and more briefly, continue in faith. Paul says to his readers, you're reconciled in Christ. Now continue in faith. Keep going. Look down with you, please, at verse 23. Verse 23, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. Are we nearly there yet? Yes, continue in your faith. How do we know that we're reconciled in Christ? How can we know that's true for us well, if we continue in our faith, continue trusting Jesus. I wonder how we react to that little word, if, at the beginning of verse 23. It says we're reconciled in Christ if we continue in faith. My first reaction to that is to be worried. Oh, dear. I was getting all kind of confident, and now how can I know that I am reconciled if 
It depends on me keeping going in faith. Um, now, um, Joel Moore can correct uh, me afterwards. But I understand that in ancient Greek, there are three different ways of saying if. Now, you don't need ancient Greek to understand the Bible, thankfully. Um, we've got some brilliant Bible translations. This just adds a bit of color. Um, but it, it's amazing, isn't it, to have three different ways of saying if. And this way, in this verse here, it, can you see it? Verse 23, where he says, um, you've been reconciled by Christ if you continue in your faith. This kind of if means... I'm told, if and we assume that you will. It's not if and mm, you probably won't. It's if and we assume that you will. Um, it says, he has reconciled you if and we're confident that you will continue in your faith. Now, I believe in what theologians call the perseverance of the saints. In other words, I believe that God keeps Christians going to the end. Because Jesus said it. Jesus said we're safe in his hands. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I give my sheep eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. That's why I know I'm going to heaven. But if I'm not walking with Jesus as my Savior and Lord, if I'm walking away from him, then I don't have that confidence. And the way God stops us from falling away is to tell us and to help us to keep trusting Jesus. So can Christians fall away? The most common answer in the Bible is don't. It's like, um, imagine a swimmer holding on to a life belt. And the life belt is Jesus in the illustration. And the swimmer asks the lifeguard, is it theoretically possible that I should let go? The lifeguard says, well, jolly well, don't. Hold on, to the, hold on to the life belt. Hold on to Jesus. Are we nearly there yet? Uh, yes, continue in faith. Keep going. Don't move away. Halfway through verse 23. This is the gospel. Sorry, verse 23, halfway through. Don't move away from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard, and it has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Remember, Paul's readers were hearing these voices which were tempting them to move on from Christ. And Paul says, no, Jesus is enough. The hope of heaven held out in the good news about Jesus, that's enough. Don't add to that. Don't move away from that. Continue in faith. When I was a student, I went on a long uh, aeroplane flight, and... Um, it, it, it was a cheap airplane flight, and part of that was it landed halfway at an airport. Um, I won't tell you where. And um, you had to wait about six hours for your next plane to take off and then to, take, to bring me back to the UK. And um, uh, it wasn't a great experience at that airport. Um, we sat there. It was just a big square room, about twice as big as this room probably. Um, and it was hot. And there was just a, a little cafe and a little souvenir shop. And that was it. And um, we had to sit there for about six, eight hours. And um, now, the airport offered us, they said to us, um, hey, why didn't you come and have a look around the city, around the capital? Um, we've got a special bus for you. Uh, you've got some time to spare. Come and have a ride. We'll show you around. The only thing you need is to, to hand in your passports. Leave your passports here, and we'll show you around. Now, my friend I was traveling with got really annoyed with me at this point because um, they wanted to do the bus trip, I thought, hmm, I don't want to have my passport in. I'm not sure about this. I want to make sure I get home tomorrow to my bed back, back in England. Um, and so I didn't go on the bus. I held on to my passport to make sure that I could get on the next plane and get home. I wonder if it's a tiny bit like that. Was I right or wrong? Who knows? But when it comes to Jesus, don't take the bus. Don't hand in your passports. See, what if following Jesus feels really hard? What if we're going through a dark period and the walls feel like they're closing in? What if something else sounds more exciting? Don't move away from faith in Christ. Continue in faith. And what a hope it is. What good news. 
Why would you move away from that? End of verse 23, it's been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. What does that mean, proclaimed to every creature under heaven? Had Paul been to Timbuktu and proclaimed it to the camels? No. Um, possibly this is um, hyperbole. Um, some commentators think he's uh, almost exaggerating to make a point. Earlier uh, in the letter, he said that as the gospel is growing throughout the whole world, all roads lead to Rome. He's preached it in Rome, and he knows it will go from Rome to the ends of the earth. Or it could be. Uh, other commentators suggest that verse 23 should be translated not that the gospel has been proclaimed, that it is proclaimed. Uh, it's for proclamation uh, to every creature on earth. Either way, this is the only hope for our world. This is the message for every creature on earth. Not only for Colossae then, but for Marlborough now, and for every nation, if we'll take it to them. So let's not move on to quick fixes, which offer a sticking plaster to the sorrows and stresses of life. Continue by faith in Jesus. And if you sense that we're drifting from Jesus, be careful. And if we stop this Christian habit that keep us going, or if we allow sin to fester, unrepented. Be careful. Let's continue in faith. Maybe you say, Reuben, I can't see it. I can't feel it when I'm in the office or the classroom um, or when the email makes my stomach lurch or when I fall over. I don't have the hope. I don't have the confidence. Friends, along the Christian road, if all you see are the potholes and the fallen trees, and the wild animals, and the long winding roads. Keep trusting Jesus. We do live by faith. We don't live by sight. We live in hope, but it is certain hope. And so if the only thing keeping you going as a Christian is faith, rejoice. That is genuine Christianity. And know for sure you're reconciled by Christ. Are we nearly there yet? Friends, let's continue in faith, and then we can say we are reconciled by God.